Paul anymore, so please welcome from Digital Rebellion, John Chappelle. Now, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a suite um, called Pro Media Tools, which is a suite of 10 utilities, um, which is designed to uh, simplify media management and stream common workflows. And uh, I'm going to need this later, so I'll just hide that for now. Um, first thing, um, I mean, there's, there's just so much stuff here that um, I don't have time to show everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some common problems that editors face and how Pro Media Tools solves them. Now, um, when you round trip to another application such as After Effects, um, you may sometimes get gamma shifts, meaning that uh, the file you export may be slightly lighter or darker than uh, the original file. And um, I got some sample clips here. So this is the original. And uh, I don't know how well you can see this on the projector, but um, this is um, very overblown. Yeah, you can't see it very well there. But um, just, just take my word for it that it is very blown out on the screen. Oh, OK, good, good. And uh, luckily, we have a tool for dealing with that called Gamma Shift Detector. So what you do is you um, take the source clip, bring it into the left-hand side, um, take the uh, gamma shifted clip, put it on the right-hand side, and what it will do is it will scan um, the frames of both files and um, detect the uh, gamma between the two and see if there's a difference. And if it does detect a difference, it will tell you the percentage difference. So it might say uh, the one on the right is 8% lighter. So you can then go back to your application like After Effects, and um, you can make it 8% darker in order to compensate. Um, the second thing it checks is um, it compares the metadata between the two files. And um, what the metadata does is it tells um, QuickTime Player and Final Cut Pro and other QuickTime applications how the file was encoded and what it should look like on screen. And um, sometimes that uh, when you round trip, that metadata doesn't get passed through correctly. And so um, it can lead to big differences in the exported clip. So I'm just going to run a scan, see what it comes up with. So it says uh, no noticeable shift on the pixels, but it's noticed that there's a mismatch in the metadata. So I can click sync metadata, and as you can see, it's copied uh, the metadata from the first one to the second one, and that's resolved the shift. But let's just save it and uh, double check. Give that a couple of seconds to save. OK, and if we put these side by side, you can now see that they both match perfectly. And it's solved. It's fixed the gamma shift. And um, if you're working uh, on a feature film that's doing a DI, um, you might be using image sequences. And what that means is that um, instead of having your media in QuickTime files, you have a separate image file for each individual frame. So depending on uh, the length of your film and uh, your shooting ratio, you could end up with hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of files uh, on your system. When you've got um, such a large number of files, um, it's very easy for things to go wrong. And so Battery Namer has a very useful function that will allow you to check for frame gaps. And uh, gaps can occur um, if you're moving files around a lot. Um, they can occur if, um, say, you're exporting from your compositing package and you set the uh, in and out points incorrectly. It's very, it's very common. I've done it a million times. And um, so what you, you just bring uh, the, the entire image sequence into Battery Namer and then go to Tools, check for frame gaps. As you can see, it's found two gaps, and it tells you the exact locations where the gaps are. So you can then go back and try to investigate what went wrong and find those missing files and restore them. But sometimes um, there won't be any files to restore. Sometimes you may have just made a mistake when you were numbering them. So what you can do is you can use uh, Battery Namer to uh, close the gaps. So you just click Close Number Gaps. Then if you scroll down, 
as you can see, there was a big gap here, 29 to 35. That gap's now been closed. And um, you can see that it did end on 54, now it ends on 47. So it's closed all of the gaps there automatically. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it's any type of file. Okay. It doesn't have to even be image files. It can just be anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, if you've used Final Cut Pro 10, you may be familiar with a function called timeline index. And what that does is um, it provides a summary of everything in your project. So it shows you all the media, it shows you all the markers, it shows you all the metadata. We have something very similar called project overview. And uh, this is for Final Cut Pro 7 and Adobe Premiere Pro. And um, it'll show you all of the media in your project. Um, it will show you how many times a particular file has been used uh, in the usage column here. And uh, unfortunately, uh, all, this uh, all these files are offline. But if they were online, then you'd be able to see um, how much space they were taking up on disk in this pie chart here, which is very useful. Um, you can also see all of the effects, all of the filters, all of the generators in your project and you can batch, uh, enable, disable, and remove them. So for example, if I wanted to uh, disable all color correctors, I could search for color corrector three-way, select all, disable, and then all of my color corrections have been disabled in just a matter of seconds. And, um, but where Project Overview really shines is in marker management. And um, you can uh, mass edit the markers, so I can add a comment to all of these selected markers. Um, you can uh, set them as chapter scoring, compression markers. You can adjust the uh, positions. You can offset them, meaning move them left or right uh, on the timeline, as you see. Um, you can also change the colors. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't set it up on this computer, because this isn't my computer. But um, you can also set custom labels for the markers. Now, a lot of um, post houses will have their own color scheme. Like, red might mean um, this is a bad cut. Green might mean um, we need to sh uh, swap this shot for a visual effects shot. And so you can actually label the colors um, with your own uh, specific naming scheme uh, to help keep everyone on the same page. And uh, I'm just going to make all these green. There we are. And um, one thing that's very interesting you can do is you can add custom columns within Project Overview. And um, you can just add your own data to these columns. So it's a way of tagging the markers with extra information. So um, for instance, if I wanted to tag my markers with the name of the person who'd created them, so I could keep track of who'd added what. Then I could just add a new user field, like so. And now it appears there. Then I can just select uh, multiple ones. I'll just add my name as the user. And then what you can do is you can then uh, print them out. And um, you probably can't see it very well in the preview window, but I'll, I'll uh, show you that in a second, uh, a bit bigger. Um, you can select all of the columns you want to print, and uh, this updates in real time to show you what it's going to look like. And you can also add your um, user columns, your, your custom columns. And so um, this is a great way of communicating extra data, extra information to your team members. And let's take a look at that. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And you can completely customize the columns. And uh, it's included my custom column as well with my username and all of the comments. Now, another thing you can do, which is very useful, is you can import markers from Final Cut Pro marker lists and Avid locator lists. And this is very useful because um, Final Cut Pro can export markers, but for some reason, Apple didn't add a function to import markers. And um, so this is the only way to do it. And so um, I have a marker list here that was created by our iPad app, um, Cut Notes, which is uh, an app for creating timecode notes during a screening. 
And that'll, that can output in uh, a variety of formats, uh, one of which is uh, Final Cut Pro marker lists. And uh, this is our recommended way of getting those markers into Final Cut Pro or uh, Adobe Premiere. And as you can see, it's imported all of the markers, including all of the comments and all of the extra data. So that's very, very useful. And um, if I can find that. Okay, in Final Cut Pro, I have a very, very messy project here. And I've just got a whole load of clips that I've just thrown in any old how without bothering to organize them. And um, if you've ever used um, Final Cut Pro 10, you may be familiar with uh, its clip collections, which is um, a way of creating um, dynamic groups of clips based on their metadata. And we've got something very similar called Quick Fins. And this is for, um, this is for uh, Final Cut Pro 7 and Adobe Premiere. So uh, you open up the project in Quick Bins, and there are three types of Quick Bins you can create. You can create a bin range. What that is is um, a group of empty sequentially numbered bins. So say I wanted to order all of these by scene. I could, I know there are um, 20 scenes, so I could create um, 20 empty bins to help me order them uh, by scene. And so that, that saves some time, but it's not, it doesn't save a great deal of time because I've still got to drag all of these into the relevant bins and still, I've still got to find out what goes where. So the second type um, is a smart bin. And what this does is it automatically um, adds media files based uh, on the uh, criteria you specify. So if you've ever used um, iTunes Smart Playlists, then you'll be able to pick this up uh, very easily as it's uh, very similar. So I'm gonna add, automatically add all of the clips from scene 10. So I go scene is 10, create. And as you can see, it's added all of the takes from scene 10. And so that can be very useful, that can save a lot of time, but again, I've still got to do that 20 times because I've got 20 scenes in this project. So that brings me to the third type of quick bin, and this is a smart bin range. And what you do here is you select your criteria, um, such as scene, codec, file extension, there's a whole range of options there. And it goes through and analyzes your media and creates a new bin for each variation. And so what it's done is it's gone through and it's seen all of the individual scenes and automatically populated files underneath them, as you can see. And I'll just make it a bit bigger. So there are all the files in each relevant scene. So you can just go send to Final Cut Pro. And give it a couple of seconds. And there we are. And the horrible mess has disappeared, and it's now been replaced with some very neat uh, bins for each scene, all with the media files underneath them. 